Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we open source your brain for weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Professor Matthew Rimmer completes our talk about intellectual property and COVID vaccines. First up, here's news about dementia. Sound Alzheimer's Treatment The University of Queensland has found that aged mice given ultrasound scans at 1 MHz across their heads had improvements in spatial memory, improved signalling between brain cells, and increased growth of new brain cells. In wild mice, memory fails by the time they're 18 months old, and they die at around 26 months old. The mice were trained in an active place avoidance task, where they associate certain places with an electric shock to a foot. Treated mice received half a dozen four-minute sessions of ultrasound over two weeks. Ultrasound-treated mice were better at avoiding the shocks than untreated mice, indicating enhanced hippocampal-dependent spatial learning. The more ultrasound sessions they received, the better their memories became. Previous work had suggested that ultrasound somehow opens transient receptor potential anchorin-1 calcium channels in astrocyte brain cells. This receptor pathway appears to be involved in the formation and recall of memories. The researchers found higher levels of transient receptor potential anchorin-1 in the treated mice. Previous experiments had aimed at opening the blood-brain barrier using ultrasound and tiny fat bubbles with a view to allowing toxins out of the brain or allowing drugs in. The researchers established that in this experiment, the blood-brain barrier was not changed by the use of ultrasound, despite the improvements to memory. Using proteomics, the researchers identified 39 proteins in the mice that were changed by the ultrasound treatment. 21 were increased and 18 decreased. The researchers conclude that ultrasound on its own can cause improvements to cognition in aged mice, and the treatment doesn't require any drugs or surgery or opening of the blood-brain barrier. They're conducting safety trials in humans. If it's shown to be effective in people, this could be a quick, cheap, safe and painless treatment for age-related cognitive decline, and perhaps even dementia. Sign me up for a weekly buzz. The paper was titled, Low Intensity Ultrasound Restores Long-Term Potentiation and Memory in Senescent Mice Through Pleiotropic Mechanisms, Including NMDAR Signaling, and was published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. TRIPS waivers. Matthew Rimmer is Professor of Intellectual Property and Innovation Law at the Queensland University of Technology, Faculty of Business and Law. I spoke with him by Zoom and continued by asking him how have other nations responded to the change in attitude by the United States in allowing waivers on vaccine patents. Very interesting to see the responses to the TRIPS waiver. Some countries switched their position almost immediately. So New Zealand's Jacinda Ardern very quickly switched to a position of support for the TRIPS waiver in light of the US position. Other countries have said that they will reconsider 
their position without necessarily firmly committing to an outcome. So the Australian government had a rather ambiguous statement saying that they welcomed the statement by Ambassador Tai and that they would engage in constructive engagement on the issue of a TRIPS waiver. So it'll be interesting to see what the Morrison government will do in that respect. Previously, Scott Morrison had said a year ago to the United Nations that history would judge those who didn't share vaccines and other key technologies. So I don't think it will be a significant jump for the Morrison government to make. The Canadian government has been equivocating quite a bit in terms of how it will deal with the TRIPS waiver, but often Justin Trudeau is a bit of a fence-sitter in many geopolitical issues and that could be a bit of an issue in terms of reaching a resolution in terms of what they want to do. There have been Canadian pharmaceutical companies like Bialy's that have been wanting to send vaccines to other jurisdictions. They've recently received an offer from Bolivia saying Bolivia wants to get their generic versions of, of vaccines. The Canadian government does really need to assist and help them to make that export happen under the WTO General Council decision mechanism that was established in Canada. There has been kind of ongoing debate in the European Union about their response to the TRIPS waiver. Some individual countries have been quite enthusiastic about the TRIPS waiver. So I was just reading a op-ed by the leader of Spain in the Financial Times over the past day, and they said that they wanted to support the TRIPS waiver. Von der Leyen, the leader of the European Union, though, has been resistant to supporting a TRIPS waiver, and she kind of has said that really the European Union wants to address other issues like exports, which really is a separate issue. The European Union has been saying that they have exported some medicines and some vaccines elsewhere around the world and other countries should also engage in exports. Uh, They've also kind of discussed what about a pandemic treaty. Really seems to be Germany that is behind the resistance to a suspension of the TRIPS agreement. I mean, Germany does host a major biopharmaceutical industry, including vaccine developers. Merkel has also sounded resistant to a TRIPS waiver. And I think that has been very contradictory in terms of the positioning of the European Union. You know, last year, the European Union were busy saying that vaccines should be treated as global public goods. This year, they are saying we should retain proprietary patent rights. And some leaders have flip-flopped a little bit. So Emmanuel Macron said, oh, the TRIPS waiver sounds very exciting. And the next day, he seemed to have been kind of whipped into line by Germany and was saying that he had doubts and reservations over the TRIPS waiver. So we'll see what happens in terms of the position of the European Union. The United Kingdom, I guess, is also a really key country, given that it was kind of key to some of the vaccine development. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown has been really trying to push the United Kingdom to support the TRIPS waiver. Boris Johnson has been a hard man to pin down on this particular topic, but there does seem to be a bit of a push from some politicians in the United Kingdom Parliament to take action on the TRIPS waiver. In Ireland, there does seem to be a stronger willingness to take on board the TRIPS waiver as well. Ireland, I I guess, has close connections to the United Kingdom and is part of the European Union. We'll see what role they play. I guess the TRIPS waiver has been hotly resisted by biomedical industries. So in particular, I saw that Pfizer was busy complaining to an Australian committee that a TRIPS waiver would undermine distribution of vaccines and the safety of vaccines. That seemed to me rather hollow in terms of the assertions that were being made there. You know, really the pharmaceutical drug companies have had a long time to deal with the distribution problems in relation to the vaccines and they have not done so thus far. In terms of safety, in terms of the TRIPS waiver, the idea is to 
build more biomanufacturing facilities around the world and ensure that they're properly safe. But nonetheless, there will be, I guess, an effort by those biomedical companies to try to resist the adoption of a TRIPS waiver. But I guess a key consideration at the moment is to ensure that we manufacture more vaccines and a cover diverse set of vaccines and we distribute them much more widely around the world. And that does involve not only suspension of intellectual property, but some sort of technology transfer to enable the creation and development of new local vaccine development sites. So from an Australian context, the Victorian government has been very keen on setting up its own vaccine development facility. So perhaps that, the proposal for a TRIPS waiver might help in terms of that role. And obviously Australia plays a really critical role regionally in terms of helping out some of our Pacific neighbours in terms of access to essential medicines. Papua New Guinea is clearly in a COVID crisis at the moment. Australia has been very kind of concerned about East Timor and other Pacific nations. Fiji nobly became a TRIPS waiver supporter when it became hit by a COVID outbreak. But ideally, you know, we need other mid-tier nations around the world to develop their own vaccine development capacity. We can't be so dependent upon the United States and the European Union for manufacturing distribution of vaccines. So merely the suspension of TRIPS is not enough. We do need to kind of take some further positive measures to share intellectual property and share knowledge. So perhaps we also may need to make better use of the CTAP model set up by Costa Rica and the World Health Organization, but also the medicines patent pool so we can share intellectual property and share knowledge. In order to have an effective global response to the COVID crisis, we do need for there to be vaccine equality and equity. We do need for there to be truly a people's vaccine. There's a great deal of concern about COVID variants kind of uh, appearing the longer that the COVID crisis stretches out. It's not going to be enough merely to kind of vaccinate developed nations like the United States and members of the European Union and Australia, even though we've, our rollout has been a bit of a stroll out thus far. Um, we do need to ensure vulnerable communities around the world are vaccinated. We do need to ensure that frontline health workers and frontline workers in aged care um, are properly vaccinated. And we also need to ensure that there's proper equitable distribution of other technologies as well. In the Indian crisis, we've certainly seen that access to oxygen has been a critical issue, as well as access to medicines. I was reading a Supreme Court decision in India in which there was a very heartfelt concern by the Supreme Court of India for the Indian government to do more to deal with the COVID crisis. So I think this topic raises larger questions about human rights and the right to health and equity and equality. And we do need to think about ways and means of having much greater universal access to health care. It's been very sobering in the past day to read the independent report by Helen Clark and Ellen Sirleaf Johnson saying that really the world should have done a much better job at responding to the COVID outbreak. There were lots of previous reports and investigations about the need to be prepared for a pandemic and they were sadly ignored. Their report makes a lot of really interesting recommendations on ways and means to improve our future international response to COVID. Clearly, we need to invest um, in global health institutions like the World Health Organization in a much more substantive way. We also need to put in place new treaties and agreements and infrastructure so we're not caught unawares or, by, or surprised by the next pandemic. The report is really interesting as well in terms of highlighting some of the issues around access to medicines and human rights and the importance of kind of public health 
so as part of our COVID uh, response and recovery, we do need to think about being better prepared for these sorts of issues in the future, given that we seem to have been a little bit forgetful about some of the past outbreaks of infectious diseases and some of the conflicts that have arisen in relation to intellectual property and access to, to medicines. We, we need to have a response in the future that um, recognises the sanctity of life and ensures that there is truly a, a global universal response to public health crises and a fair and equitable approach to access to vaccines and medicines and treatments and diagnostics, as well as other public health equipment. So we do need to invest more in global public health. We do. And wasn't the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine originally going to be offered as open source? Yeah, there's been a lot of debate about that particular venture. Apparently, initially, Oxford University were going to take the view that they're going to make it publicly accessible. And then it was alleged that the Gates Foundation then kind of pushed them to go down to the approach of relying much more upon patent protection. Um, it's been noticeable that one of the entities to flip their position on the TRIPS waiver has been the Gates Foundation. So the, the Gates Foundation have come out and said that after the repositioning of the Biden administration, they support a narrow TRIPS waiver, uh, whatever that might consist of. But uh, it's certainly the case that institutions had other options available to them in their approach to intellectual property. You know, historically, sometimes we have dedicated key critical technologies to the public domain. So some have kind of talked about, you know, the development of insulin being kind of dedicated to the public domain by Salk. Curie famously went down a kind of a public approach in relation to some of her inventions and discoveries. CERN, when it accidentally came up with the World Wide Web, made the very kind of conscious decision that that should be a public good. So I think that's been a very frustrating part of the debate over intellectual property and COVID. A number of national governments have used the rhetoric that vaccines should be global public goods, but nonetheless relied upon patent protection. Given the huge amount of public funding in the research and development effort, there really should have been greater terms and conditions dealing with ensuring equitable supply of those medicines. I think in retrospect, perhaps the national governments gave some of the biomedical companies much too much of a free reign in terms of their development and distribution of those vaccines. We shouldn't have been so reliant upon big transnational companies like Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson and Moderna to be in charge of the global distribution of vaccines and medicines. You know, in retrospect, national governments should have ensured that there was public distribution of those vaccines or at the very least, you know, non-exclusive flexible distribution of those vaccines. In the way that they went down in terms of the agreements has led to some of those companies having a very strong market position in which they can really kind of set terms to countries and demand various things of countries. So there's certainly been complaints that I've read of South American and Latin American countries kind of complaining about bullying by biomedical companies in negotiations over access to vaccines. So there, there are some other choices that could have been made but also, I think some countries privatised their own local biomanufacturing capacity. So in Australia, we had CSL, which became a private company. Would have been very useful to have that entity still in public hands. You know, we did have an effort with the University of Queensland to try to develop vaccines, but that didn't turn out as well as we had hoped. But we do need greater local manufacturing capacity in different individual states. We can't just be even a developed country like Australia, dependent upon the goodwill of other superpowers and kind of dependent upon 
good graces of multinational biomedical companies. We do need some local manufacturing capacity. And that's certainly been a conclusion in Canada. The Canadian budget released by Christia Freeland had a bit of strong emphasis on local biomanufacturing as a key item in the budget. But certainly there have been researchers like Richard Gold from McGill University who have said that we really need to rethink the way in which we engage in vaccine development. He's been an advocate of a publicly funded, open source model of vaccine development in Canada. He has argued that we really need to fund open source models of innovation much more. And really, we've been much too dependent upon proprietary models of the innovation in relation to biomedicine, which hasn't really been properly focused upon global burdens of disease as they should have been. And I'd heard that there's an open source one being developed by Harvard University and the government of India, the OpenVax. Have you heard of that? Uh, I haven't looked deeply into kind of the OpenVax proposal. There has been quite a bit of discussion about how we can adapt open licensing strategies to the field of biomedicine. Traditionally, you know, open licensing has kind of worked best in relation to copyright law. So with free software and open source licensing of information technology, that was fairly straightforward. Our experience has been in the sciences, it's sometimes a little bit harder to deal with patent thickets. So, you know, open ag, open biology, open medicine, open clean tech. These models have been experimented with, but there are limits to what they can do given the existence of lots and lots of patents in relation to some of those landscapes. But I I think open source agreements between countries and universities seems to be a very sensible way to develop new technologies. The open COVID pledge model that I talked about before had been supported by the Creative Commons movement, which is interested in open licensing. I think um, now it's going to be managed by the Info Justice Project at the American University. But the Costa Rica proposal, I think, in, in some ways could also be considered an open model of licensing. But I think those models really need to be scaled up to the point that they are significant. But they still often depend upon, you know, the participation of key players. And I think... You know, if the biomedical companies are unwilling to assist or help nation states, nation states do have the ability to use compulsory licensing powers or crown use powers to compel access to patent inventions. And we've often seen those provisions invoked previously in relation to HIV AIDS, but also in relation to things like kind of cancer medicines as well. I think the biomedical companies have been so obstructive that they really face those measures being used to demand that they provide access to their inventions. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not the biomedical companies are going to be a little bit more cooperative and collaborative. I think, you know, the TRIPS waiver has grown in momentum, partly because of the behaviour of the biomedical companies and their unwillingness to share their intellectual property and help out nations in crisis. You know, I think the TRIPS waiver has grown in force, partly because of uncooperative behaviour around intellectual property. Well, Professor Matthew Rimmer, thank you very much. That was the second and final part of my discussion with Professor Matthew Rimmer from Queensland University of Technology about the battle over medical patents and how it's affected the fight to save people from HIV, SARS, flu, and now COVID-19. And now a word from the Australian Prime Minister. We're here today to announce that we're announcing here today the announcement that we're announcing all of the announced measures of this announcement on the basis of the announcement we have made today. And at this stage, having just announced it, um, we'll be announcing further measures on uh, these matters uh, once they're finalised. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? 
Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in North East Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf, or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.